Oh. Hello. Yes, I just noticed. I forgot all about the invitation. Sorry about yeah. that. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I just saw it. It's like um, I think everyone else is in the other class, unfortunately. So um, I think they're in the other um, Zoom Zoom meeting. Oh, that's that one was only meant for yeah. Um, I, you know what? Because the the way it's set up, I don't think it's possible to set up invitations for like certain days of the week. What I have to do is like there's one for every Monday, there's one for every Tuesday and one for Thursday. So I can't really set the whole thing in advance, or at least I don't think so. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I because, you know, what the thing is, it's been a while since I did online. And, um, you know, you get into the habit of like sending out invitations when you're constantly teaching online. And so because like this is the first time in almost a year, um, I just had completely forgotten that I had to do this every day. Yeah. <laughs> um so that I, I was sitting here i turned it on and there was nobody there and i realized oh my god um i forgot so, uh, yeah i just saw the saw the email and i was like oh okay i should just yeah. switch over really quickly okay cool i normally try to do it first thing in the morning but you know like i said since i've gotten completely out of the habit um i've been doing only in-person classes for a while now when during the COVID, i would never have forgotten it because I had to do it every day. So um, that's how this happens. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, all right, well, I guess we'll give everyone a minute to catch up and um, we'll get started. But because it was so embarrassing, I'm sure it won't happen again because I'll remember that. Um, so um, just as a quick reminder, we're only here on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So we're not meeting tomorrow at all. But we'll be back again on Thursday at the same time. All right. So in case there's any doubt in anyone's mind about when we're meeting. All right. I think this is everybody we had from last night. So I, I you know, don't know if you heard me or not. I was apologizing because I forgot to send out the. Uh, just leave it. Just fine. Just leave it. Um, you know, what? You could, if you don't see it during the day, you can feel free to send me an email and say, hey, where's our invitation? Uh, because there's. You know, like I was saying, there, I haven't been doing online for a while, so uh, I, I was afraid this was going to happen eventually. And so, um, yeah, go ahead. I mean, if you if you like tomorrow, let's say Thursday when we meet again, sometime in the day, if you haven't seen your invitation, you can feel free to just write to me and say, "Listen, where's the invitation?" Um, you know, and I'll just send it right out. But I'm going to try to have it done in the mornings. The thing is, um, I don't think each invitation is reusable. I think it's only meant for that one session. I don't think you can reuse them. So, uh, but I'm not sure how that works. So try to try to make sure that the one you're using is the one for that day. All right, well, anyway, with that being said, let's get back to where we left off. And you can see we're gonna do the composition of functions, which basically just means we're applying algebraic operations to functions rather than uh, constants. So um, you can see that among other things, we can add functions, we can subtract them, we can multiply them and we can divide them. And they're these are very straightforward. Later on, we'll be doing something which is not quite as straightforward. So um, just as a quick, simple example, uh, we have f of x is x minus two and g of x is x squared plus one. So we're gonna go through all four of these um, algebraic operations. And so we'll start by adding them. And it's exactly the way you would expect it to work out. You just literally add together. The only thing you have to watch out for is the parentheses. So here with addition, um, all we can do, uh, we just drop the parentheses and we end up with our final result, which is X squared plus X minus one. No problem there. Subtraction is the one where we really have to be careful because it's easy to overlook this, uh, the fact that you're subtracting everything inside the parentheses. So here we ended up with x minus two, then we subtract x squared and we subtract one. And so when we combine all those terms, you end up with x squared plus x minus three. Uh, sorry, minus x squared plus x minus three. Now multiplication is a little different. Um, for, for something like this, um, you can do a couple of things. Let me just write this out on a separate uh, slide. So let's see, you've got x minus two. And x squared plus one. So of course we can use FOIL. And if we use FOIL, what would happen is you'd have x 
So first would be these two. Outer is this. Inner is minus 2x squared. And last is these two. And when you consolidate all these together, you get x cubed minus 2x squared plus x minus 2. And if you notice, just by convention, we like to write polynomials like this with the highest exponent first, followed by the second highest, all the way down to the constant. Now, let me show you another technique you can use. Now, the only problem with FOIL is the two terms that you're using have to both have exactly two terms in them. In other words, uh, if you have more than two terms in either uh, set of parentheses, you can't use FOIL. But there's another approach you can use, which um, I think might be a little more straightforward. It certainly is more general. What I'm about to show you could be used no matter how many terms you have. You may have seen this before. What you're basically doing is you're taking the terms and multiplying them. So in other words, you're multiplying these two terms. Then you're multiplying these two terms. And then, so that would be the first row. And then you multiply these terms, you get 2x squared. And then you multiply these two terms to give you x cubed. And you combine all of these. And of course, you're getting the same thing. But again, like the second technique I just showed you, you can use that for any number of terms. It's not restricted to multiplying two binary terms like we have with FOIL. All right, and then with um, division, division is different because often we end up in a situation where we can't really simplify this any further. So you just leave it like this. Um, you know, sometimes you can. If you can simplify it, you might as well go ahead and do that. But you know, it's not really absolutely necessary. Um, and if it's a very complicated ratio, then you may as well just leave it like this. Here, there's really nothing we can do to make it any simpler. So we'll just leave it that way. Now, here's where it gets interesting. We have these so-called composite functions. So this little zero means we're taking f and treating it as a function of g. And here, g is a function of f. So it can be written in two equivalent ways. And so how does that work? Well, you're effectively evaluating, in the first case, wherever you see an x, you're going to replace it with g of x. In the second case, wherever you see an x, you'll replace it with f of x. So why don't we do a couple of examples of this? Um, we'll take the same two functions we had a minute ago, and we'll apply these composite functions to them. OK, so here they are. I've repeated them right here. So f of g of x, what you're basically doing, you're taking f of x. And where, wherever you see an x, you replace it with g of x. OK, so in this particular case, as you can see, that's going to leave you with simply g of x minus 2. And since g of x is x squared plus 1, you subtract the 2 from that, and this is your final result. So basically, again, what you're doing is within the f of x function, wherever you see an x, you replace it with g of x and then evaluate it. And that's your final answer. Okay, now what if we want to do g of f of x? In other words, do the opposite. Oops. <laughs> um, this time, you're replacing these x's with f of x's. Now, because that x is squared, of course, that means what you're actually doing, as you can see it right here, is replacing that x squared with f of x squared. Okay, now f of x is x minus 2. And if you apply FOIL to that, we'd have x squared minus 2x, again minus 2x, and then 4. So the final result there would be x squared minus 4x plus 4. So you can see down here, 
That's exactly what I've done. This x minus two squared has been replaced with x squared minus four x plus four, and then we add the one at the end. And so this is our final result. So it looks really messy and complicated. It doesn't have to be. Um, as long as you just remember that all you're really doing is replacing the x's with either f of x or g of x. Now, if the functions themselves are very messy, this could actually get very complicated. But the basic concept is not that difficult, okay? So, and by the way, you'll get plenty of opportunities to practice. Uh, you know, in the problem sets, you'll get a chance to do quite a few of these and make sure that you're getting pretty good at this. Now, we can evaluate a composite functions just like we can evaluate the individual functions. What you're essentially doing is you're um, evaluating the what's called inside function. Now, what do I mean by that? So for something like this, f of g of x, you're, you're actually calculating a numerical value for g of x. And once you have that, you plug it in to wherever you see x in the function f of x. So it really, again, it isn't really that difficult um, unless the functions are horrendously complicated. So here's a good one. f of x is x plus seven. g of x is two uh, x minus three. What about the value of f of g of one? And by the way, you could actually figure out if you wanted to just solve for f of g of x. And then replace all the x's with a one. But I think you'll find that it's easier and quicker to do it this way. In other words, you're replacing g of x with a constant. That should make it simpler to solve for f of g of x. Okay, so let's see how that would work. So uh, just a quick reminder, yes, here it is. F of X is here. This is G of X. And then G of one means you're replacing each X with a one. So you get two times one squared minus three, which is two minus three or negative one. And now that goes into the X here. So F of G of one is equivalent to F of negative one, as you can see right here. This is the key to the whole thing. And that's pretty straightforward because now all you're doing is replacing all the x's in f with negative one, and the final result is six. The computer was uh, getting a little cranky there for a second. All right, so, oh, by the way, let me save this real fast. Um, with the name of uh, today's dates, because this way um, you'll know that it has the notes that we handwritten wrote in here tonight. Oops. Today is the seventh. All right. Now for the same functions, how about G of F of one? All right, so this time, f of x is the so-called interior function or inside function. So we'll evaluate f of x where x equals one. So you can see again, we're replacing that x with a one. f of one is eight. And since g of x is two x squared minus three, that implies that g of f of x is the same thing as g of eight. And now that x squared becomes eight squared. So you have two times eight squared minus three or two times 64 minus three, which ultimately turns out to be 125. So if anything, these are a little bit simpler than these uh, cases, because at least now you have the ability to replace one of the functions with a constant before you evaluate the outer function. All right. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. We're going to try to find the domain of a composite function. It's a little bit trickier than, uh, than what we were doing before. Um, what exactly do we have to do here? Well, it should be pretty clear. That the domain of f of x is everything except one. Oops. So we can write it like this. And of course, remember from last night, this simply means that we have the re entire real number line 
except for one. The only place that the function is undefined is one because that would give us division by zero. Okay. Um, so what do, how does that help us? Because remember, we're looking for the domain of f of g of x. So f of x, we have its domain. And so that means that we have to figure out what values of g of x would result in a one, and uh, those will no longer be included in the domain. Okay, so in other words, we can't allow g of x to be equal to one because then we'd end up with division by zero. So we set this equal to one and we solve for x. Okay, so uh, algebraically, that means we have multiply both sides by three x minus two. So x equals two, what this tells me is that the domain of f of g of x is everything except two. Because if we exclude two from g of x, that guarantees that we will never have one uh, for f of x. And so this is the domain of our g of f of x. Okay, so there's, you're doing this in two stages. You start out by trying to figure out what values must be disallowed from f of x, and then you find out which values would cause g of x to have that value. In this case, that turned out to be two. So that means that the domain for this composite function is everything except two. Because leaving out two guarantees that f of x will never have one substituted into it. Now, another option would have been to do this. What if instead we calculated f of g of x directly? Okay, fine. So in other words, this is going to be replacing this x. All right. So we end up with five over g of x minus one. It's a little messy, but it looks like this, okay? So again, f of g of x is equal to five over g of x minus one, and g of x is equal to four over three x minus two. So when we combine them, this is what we end up with. All right, and then we have to do a little algebra. We need a common denominator down here uh, so we can combine these two expressions in the denominator. So let's go with 3x minus 2. Okay. And so that's why this is now here. And that way I can co combine the two numerators and they have a common denominator. So that brings me to Okay, and now I just drop the parentheses and I subtract. And let's see, that leads me with Yeah, it's getting a little messy here. Um, now, actually, let me move this to the next slide real fast. So we had five over, let's just do this again, five over four minus three X minus two over, hold on. So again, you have to watch out when you drop the parentheses, remember the negative is applied to both of these terms. So I actually have here five over six. Minus three X all over three X minus two. Now here's a quick reminder. 
um, when you have something like this, let's say you have three divided by, I don't know, two over seven. This is equivalent to saying three times seven halves. Dividing by a ratio is the same as multiplying by its inverse. All right, so this is just a little reminder. So based on that logic, this expression is the same thing as five over six minus three X times three X minus two. Okay, and that should take care of it. And so, yeah, I did it in the slides too. So that would be our f of g of x. Now, here's the question. What is the, the original question was, what is the domain? Um, of this function f of x of f of g of x. So earlier we solved for it in a different way and we found that this was every real number except for two. Okay. So when you look at this result, you can see the same thing will be true because clearly two would cause us to have division by zero. So once again, the domain is everything except two. Uh, not sorry, not negative two, two. All right, so in other words, you can see that we found the domain in two equivalent ways. Okay, now you might find this first way to be a little bit convoluted. It is, I suppose, um, because remember what we had to do. We had to find out the domain of g of x and make sure that any uh, values that don't belong in there are not substituted into f of x. Here, we just solve for f of g of x directly. And then we found the domain the normal way, just by looking for values that would lead to division by zero or possibly um, a negative square root. So either way, you're gonna end up with the correct result, the correct domain for the um, composite function. That's what it looks like, by the way. Um, you can see we already determined that the domain cannot include positive two, and you can see why, because that is an asymptote right here. This is two. The red line means that that vertical line, x equals two, is an asymptote of the function, and therefore the domain cannot include two. And you can see that the range also leads out, um, Whatever this number is, the range does not include this. There's two asymptotes, but we were only interested in the domain. Okay, so the domain is all real numbers except x equals two, which we can write in interval, interval form in the following way. Um, now, sometimes it might be useful to take the composite function and break it up into the individual functions. We're not gonna use this very often until we get into maybe chapter three, where we can actually put this to good use to simplify some of the problems that we'll be solving. So for now, let's just recognize that it can't be done. In other words, we're essentially reverse engineering what we did before. Okay, so in other words, um, if you have a function which is itself a composite of two other functions, we'd like to be able to break it up into those two pieces. So imagine we have something like this, f of x is the square root of x minus eight. Um, we're going to treat this as a composite function, g of x combined with h of x. Okay, the question is what are g of x and h of x? So here's a possibility. And by the way, sometimes it can, this can be done in more than one way. So if remember f of x was originally radical eight x minus eight, you can see if g of x had been radical x and h of x had been um, x minus eight, then g of h of x would mean radical x minus eight. It's, it's a very straightforward one. So this just demonstrates that this function can be decomposed into these two. Okay, and again, like I said, this 
you know, you might wonder, well, why would we ever do this? Um, there will come cases when being able to do this will help us simplify uh, the techniques that we use to solve problems. Uh, yeah, and you can double check it, making sure that you, of course, uh, end up with the same result. All right, absolute value functions. Now, the interesting thing about absolute value functions is that they will have typically two solutions. So here's one, f of x is the absolute value of four x plus one minus seven. What are the values of x where the function is equal to zero? Okay, well, so we take this and set it equal to zero, which implies that the absolute value of four x plus one equals seven Remember the way absolute value works. You can think of it as a piecewise function like we saw yesterday, which means it has two components to it, which are very different from each other. And so that implies that there's two solutions here. In other words, drop the absolute value signs, this is clearly the case. What it also means, actually, let me make some room here. It means both of these things are true because the absolute value of both of them on the left-hand side, if you apply the uh, absolute value, you'll always end up with four X plus one. So here we can say that 4x equals 6, x is equal to 6 fourths or 3 halves. On the left-hand side, we can say that 4x plus 1 is negative 7. Subtract 1 from both sides. So x has two solutions, 3 halves and negative 2. Because of the way absolute value is defined. So it, what that means is then you'll, you'll end up with something like this. Um, actually, that's not drawn very well. Let me fix that. And we could go to Symbol Lab and see exactly what it looks like. That, that's roughly what it should look like. In fact, all right, what the heck, let's go to Symbol Lab. I have it right here. Some are in this mess, yeah. Wait a minute, what happened? Y equals absolute X plus one. Uh, Hold on, uh, minus seven. All right, let's take a look at the graph. No, oh, it's already there. Okay, uh, yes, beautiful. Yes, exactly. So, um, hmm, that's interesting. Did I do something wrong here? Oh, I left out the four, no wonder. I was gonna say, Something doesn't look right. All right, let's try that again. Yeah, so there's the negative two and there's the positive three halves. So we're all set. All right, but it was a little challenging. I mean, this is why though, because of the way absolute value is defined, it has two possible values. So we have to take those both into account when we solve for this. All right, uh, let's try this one. So f of x is the absolute value of 2x minus seven minus five. We wanna know what are the values of which f of x equals zero. In other words, what are the solutions of this function? Where does it cross the horizontal axis? So we um, set it equal to zero, add the five to both sides. And so this implies that five equals both 2x minus seven, but it also equals the negative of 2x minus seven or negative two X plus seven. And then we use a little algebra and we discover 
that x both equals six and one. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna do something that's a little bit more complicated, this co concept of inverse functions. And um, you'll notice that the notation is a little kind of interesting here. This negative one is actually used to indicate an inverse. Uh, I don't know how they came up with this notation, but um, I guess it's because if you have, let's say x, x in minus one is one over x. So I guess that's the logic behind it. So um, this means that we have f of x, y is f of x, x is therefore the inverse of y. Here, so um, now we already know, for example, three and one over three are inverses of each other, but now we're interested in looking for functions that are inverses of each other. And you can usually tell when functions are inverses, uh, when you look at their graphs, um, and we'll do a few of these in a second. But what's important here is that first, we're going to learn how to find inverse functions. And secondly, we're going to see how to prove the two functions are, in fact, inverses of each other. So it turns out that in order to demonstrate the two functions are inverses, well, we have to show two things. And you can see where the composite functions will come in handy here. If f inverse of f of x is x, and f of f inverse of x is also x, that implies that um, f and f inverse uh, are in fact inverses of each other. Okay, but both of these conditions have to be met in order to prove that two functions are inverses of each other. Like for example, let me just show you how this would work with x squared and the square root of x. Um, it should be pretty clear that these are inverses of each other, but let's just prove it, okay? using this technique. Um, well, actually I see that I've already done this in the slides, so we don't, I don't have to write it. Uh, let's do that right now. We're gonna prove that X squared and the square root of X are inverses of each other. And you know, you can think of the inverses as essentially offsetting each other. So let's say that G, F of X is defined as X squared, G of X is the square root of X, which I've written as X to the one half power. So what I'm trying to demonstrate then is that since g of x is the inverse, I can write it like this. Remember what I'm we're saying is that f of f inverse of x is x and f inverse of f of x is also x. If, if we're using g of x, it, it, it won't make any difference. So that would be this case and that would be this case. So you can see um, g of x is the square root of x. If I square that, I get x. Down here, um, f of x is the square, uh, sorry, x squared. When I take the square root of that, I also end up with x. So this proves that x squared and the square root of x or x to the one half power are inverses. Now, how would this show graphically? Let's go to symbol lab for a second. Now, I, I'm not 100% positive um, how to put two functions on the same graph here. So we're gonna give it a shot here. Y equals X squared. Okay, let's see. Um, if I go to interactive graph, I think I can add a second function here. Oh, okay. So I, uh, <laughs> I'm not absolutely clear how you would see that these are inverses of each other. Yeah, I was hoping it would be more obvious Okay, uh, let's try something else. Some concepts that we'll be looking at later on. Yeah, you can kind of see it here. I don't know. <laughs> well, all right. Well, we can prove it algebraically. That's the important thing. 
And then of course we can ask ourselves questions. I mean, suppose we're not sure ourselves if these functions are inverses of each other. You can just go ahead and demonstrate it. Uh, or else for any two random functions, you could be uh, asked to show whether or not they're inverses. They might and they might not be. But again, if these two conditions are met, then it should be clear that four uh, X and one quarter X are in fact inverses of each other. Now, here's the tricky part. What if you have a function and you wanna know what its inverse is? That is kind of a challenge, um, but the technique itself is not that difficult. It's just that some of these functions are so messy that it can take a while, but the basic concept isn't really that difficult. So here's what you're gonna do. You start out by writing out the function. And uh, so here's, here's the tricky part. So let's say you start out with y equals one over x plus two, or f of x is one over x plus two. So here's what we're gonna do. We'll start by writing it as one over x plus two. Now here's the interesting part. We're going to reverse the roles of the x and the y. In other words, you literally just replace all the y's with x's and all the x's with y's. So here you can see, let me just copy this. You can see it. So we went from up here to down here and you see all we did was switch these two. And once you've done that, y will equal the inverse of x. So you basically solve for y. And with the understanding that whatever y is, that is your inverse. And we can prove it now that we know how to do it. So um, in this case, algebraically, let's see, how do we get that? All right, so just we multiply both sides by y plus two, uh, drop through parentheses, distribute that x over the y plus two. And remember, we're trying to solve for y, so let's get everything else over to the right-hand side. And down here, I'm gonna divide by that x. And so the final result is that with the original function y, or actually I'll write it as f of x, So that's what we're saying here. Now, in order to make sure we didn't make any mistakes, we can apply that technique we had a bit uh, a little while ago and demonstrate whether or not they're inverses of each other by showing that first, f of f inverse of x equals x. And secondly, f inverse of f of x is also x. So let's do it. So the first one will do, um, okay, I guess we could start with f inverse of f of x. So these are the functions we, this is the original function. This is our proposed um, inverse. So what you're gonna do to get f inverse of f of x is replace this, um, x becomes f of x. Okay, so you're gonna wind up with Oops. Okay, now how do I combine these two? I need a common denominator. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know, I think I may have goofed it up here. Um, oh, 
oh, I know what the problem is. Okay, sorry, I've completely screwed it up. No, it's right here. I made the wrong substitution. Sorry about that. You know what the problem is? It's not, it's one over one over X plus two. Okay, so um, yeah, because the original function was one over X plus two. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the F inverse of X was one over X minus two. So this is what I needed to do. Now this, as we saw earlier, one over one over X is equal to X. Because what you're essentially doing is you're saying one over one over X is the same as one times X over one. So that means that what I have here is X plus two minus two, which is equal to X. So that part is fun. Um, what about the second part? All right, so now we're looking at f of f inverse of x. So that means that um, oops, sorry, I wrote prime. F inverse of X plus two. Okay, so in other words, this X is replaced with F inverse of X. Okay, now when I plug in the actual function, I'm gonna end up with one over one over X, which is just X. Okay. So the proof is done. So the bottom line here is that uh, the inverse of this function is one over x minus two. So again, why don't we throw these into symbol lab and see if they, you know, if it's visibly clear why these are inverses, but we proved it algebraically and that's the important thing. Um, all right, let's do, let's try this. One over X plus two. And uh, one over X minus two. Hmm. Well, I, I don't know. I, they sort of look, I, mean, I guess you can think of it as, I don't know why there's a pink and a purple function here. I don't know what happened. Um, but anyway, we proved algebraically that these are inverse of each other. That's the bottom line. All right, anyway, so here's an interesting concept. We'll need more of this uh, later on. Right now, this is uh, just, I just wanna note here that um, if f of x equals f of negative x for every x, the function is said to be odd. And if f of x equals negative f of negative x, or, uh, sorry, I said it backwards. This one is even and this one is odd. Now, not every function is either even or odd. Okay, I just wanna mention that. Uh, many of them are not either even or odd, but it can be very helpful to know whether or not a function is even or odd. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples here. Um, let's say we're looking at this function, f of x equals x cubed plus two x. Is it odd, even, or neither? Okay, so let's just quickly remind ourselves what the conditions are. So this is even. And odd means this. Okay. 
All right, now how do you know? All right, here's what we're gonna do. Let's try to see if it is, well, let's, okay. Um, we'll try and see if it's even. So in other words, what we're gonna do is see what is the value of f of negative x, okay? So if this is the original f of x, this is what f of negative x looks like. You just replace all the x's with a negative and you can see these two are not equal to each other. Okay, so f of x does not equal f negative x. So that just tells me the function is not even. Um, and also we might as well do it right here. That implies that this is equal to x cubed plus 2x. Oh, what do you know? These are equal to each other. So since f of x equals negative f of negative x, the function is odd. How do you like that? Um, so we call that an odd function. And um, there's a picture of it here. I'm, I'm not really sure how you're supposed to tell. Basically, um, I guess the way to look at it is that if you drew a line here, you can see what's going on in the first quadrant is kind of a mirror image of what's happening in the third quadrant. If the function was even, you would only have the first two quadrants. So you've got first and third, where they are essentially mirror images of each other. And this is what an odd function basically looks like. Or you can formally think of them, the formal way of expressing that is to say that um, the function is symmetrical about the origin. Okay, in other words, the top and the, everything above the uh, horizontal axis is a mirror image of everything that's going on below it. All right, now let's try another one. So remember here, I've reminded everyone what the definitions are of odd and even. So let's try this. If f of x is x squared minus seven, f of negative x would be negative x squared minus seven. Oh, well, there you go. Which means that f of x equals f of negative x. And that means the function must be even. Now it can't be both even and odd, so we don't have to bother testing it, but um, uh, we might as well find out, uh, just prove it. Negative f of negative x would be negative x squared plus seven, which is not equal to the original function, which implies the function is not odd. We, didn't, we already knew that because we were able to prove that the function is even. And of course, most of the time, it turns out the functions are actually neither. I shouldn't say most of the time, many times. It doesn't have to be either one of them. But down the road, we will see uh, use, uses for this definition. And by the way, this function is a parabola. Like I said, um, you can see that if you can think of it as symmetrical from left to right, meaning that what's on the left-hand side of this line and the right-hand side are identical to each other, um, that's what an even function looks like. There's a symmetry from left to right, whereas with the odd functions, the symmetry is from top to bottom. All right, well, guess what? We're done with the section 1A. Now, section 1B contains material that I think is a little bit more um, down to earth because it involves linear functions, which we're all very familiar with, which is cool. But then we're going to move into some more complex functions. So this is 1B. And of course, nobody forgets ever the formula of a straight line or the equation of a straight line. Y equals MX plus B. And of course, you'll recall that M is the slope, B is the intercept, and M itself can be defined as delta Y over delta X. Now, it turns out that there's actually two equivalent ways or, or other equivalent ways of expressing a, a straight line. This is the one that you, you learned um, 
whatever grade it was, but it's not the only way that we can write out the equation of a line. There's two others that I'll show you later on, but this one is often called the intercept slope form because it includes, of course, an intercept and a slope. This is the one you're probably most familiar with. Uh, and of course, M is delta Y over delta X and delta Y itself means Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. In other words, if you take any two points in your straight line, the slope will be the same no matter which two points you choose. Okay, so in other words, the slope is a constant. And that's one of the things that separates linear functions from all the rest of them. Uh, for the higher order power of functions, there the slope is definitely not constant. So we'll start with a simple one, y equals x minus seven. And of course that tells me right away that the slope is one. There's an implied one here and the intercept is negative seven. So we have something like this. where it crosses the vertical axis at the point negative seven comma zero. It's a straight line. So no matter what two points I choose, you may have seen this drawn like this, the rise over the run is the same no matter what two points I choose. Okay. So let's just, now, here, now here's where I had to really improvise. I wasn't sure how to draw this nicely in Excel. So you can see I had to do some of it by hand, but you get the idea. Imagine these are my two points. Think of this as, let's say this is point one, and this is point two. So that means that x1 is seven, y1 is zero, uh, x2 is six, y2 is negative one. So what's the slope? All right. So we'll have uh, negative one minus zero divided by six minus seven. This is negative one over negative one. It's just one. Okay. Now, by the way, it doesn't really matter which point is one and which is two. It, you'll get the same result any way you look at it, but the slope is just one. Okay. And so we already knew that of course, because the coefficient of X is just one. But now we proved it by taking two points and calculating the actual slope between them. And you can see in the graph, as clumsy a graph as this is, um, this is negative seven right here. Now, of course, you know, you can tell a lot about the behavior of this linear function by looking at the slope and the intercept, for example, um, if M is positive, that means the function is increasing. Or you can think of it as moving. You can think of it, I guess, as moving in a northeasterly direction. It's like, imagine you're flying from San Diego to Portland, Maine. Um, you're going in this direction. That, that means the function is increasing. Um, if M is negative, so M is positive, Here M is negative, We're going from Seattle to Miami, let's say, and then M is zero is a flat line. The location depends on the intercept, but here you can see M is just zero, the slope is zero. All right. Now here's another simple example of a straight line. Y is three X minus two, which tells me that the slope is three, which means it's rising very quickly and the intercept is negative two. So you'll have something fairly steep because the slope is three instead of one and the intercept is negative right here. Okay, now I did it in Excel and you can see, um, yes, it is, it cuts through the vertical axis at negative two. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to judge how, how steep this line is by looking at this thing, but the slope is three. Okay, it's moving up fairly quickly. 
And of course, you know, it's hard to tell here, but I mean, it's understood that this line goes on off to uh, positive and negative infinity. All right, and here's one last example, negative four X plus five. So we do have a fairly steep negative slope. But the intercept is positive. The slope is negative four. Rise over the run is negative four. It's moving in a southeasterly direction. Okay, like here it is. And then finally, oh, there is one more example. The, the simple case where the slope is zero. Um, this y equals one implies that m equals zero. Therefore, the slope is zero. It's a flat line. Uh, and you'll see that it crosses through the vertical axis at one. Okay, now I did say that there's a couple of other ways we can write uh, the equation of a straight line. Here's another one. In this case, instead of having the slope and the intercept, we have the slope and a single point. So it's often called the point slope form. You can see that the X and the Y here, this is X1 comma Y1. So these two are the components of a single point in the line. And of course, M is still the slope that hasn't changed. So in other words, we can write it this way. Um, I don't know, I, I don't know if this is more convenient, but for some applications, it might be helpful to be able to do it this way. Um, but I know we're all used to thinking about it in the point slope form, um, sorry, the intercept slope form, but this is another valid way of writing out a straight line. Um, so of course, if you look at it, carefully, you'll see that the way it's written, M is still delta Y over delta X. But you don't see the intercept in this formula. You can figure it out yourself, but it's not explicitly written in the formula. So here's one. Um, so this is our function. Now, you notice what I've got here. It might not be obvious right at the bat, but this is the equation of a straight line, but it's written this way, which means the slope is two. And one of the points is negative five. Oh, sorry, this is actually five because we're subtracting it. It's actually five comma four. Okay, it's a little con uh, deceiving because we're subtracting those points. So therefore we know that the slope is five and um, that single point is five comma four. If we wanna rewrite this as the traditional point slope form, all we have to do is rearrange it algebraically. And so that tells me that the intercept after all is negative six. The slope we already knew is two. And we can confirm that this point is part of the equation simply by plugging in five and four. All right, so that do, does work. Okay, now I'm not so sure if Symbol Lab, I, I'm just dying to see how Symbol Lab would react to this. Let's just go over there and, and check it out. Um, what I'm going to ask it to do is draw that uh, line using the point slope approach. Actually, that's how, oh, there it goes. Okay, I know I have a lot of stuff open here. Uh, I can't help myself. I always do this. All right, so it was, um, Y minus four, 
equals two times x minus five. All right, let's see how it reacts to that. So the, um, the traditional formula would be 2x minus 6. Yeah, that's it. It does work. How do you like that? It's pretty smart, isn't it? Yeah, and now that happened. Oh, look what they did. Huh. There's all kinds of good stuff here. All right. So anyway, um, now, here's an interesting question. What if you were told the slope and the point, and you're asked to create the equation of that line in the point slope form? Okay, well, it's not that difficult because remember, what you're looking for is y minus y1 equals m, x minus x1. So we know that this is our x1, this is our x, uh, y1, this is m. So we have y minus minus one equals three times x minus six, or y plus one equals three x minus six, and that's it. You could stop there, or if you decided that you want to know the equivalent um, slope-intercept form, would not be difficult. And there you go. Okay, now this last one, this third one is not something we're gonna really see much of. Um, you can create a line. This, the, supposedly the benefit of this form is that um, it's easier to deal with vertical lines, but I, I, I don't know. I don't think this is gonna help us very much. It's, you can write it in the so-called standard form as ax plus by equals c, where we disallow for the possibility of a and b being both zeros. It's, you know, we're, we're not gonna really spend any time with this, but I just wanted you to know that there is actually a third alternative way of writing out a straight line. Uh, maybe we'll encounter it again, but I don't think so. All right, now, how about if we have two points and we're trying to figure out the equation of a straight line using the point slope form, the traditional approach. So we have two points and we can arbitrarily choose this to be point one and point two, it does not matter which is which. And of course, M is Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. All right, so if y equals one third x plus b, what we can do now is we can substitute any of these points into here and we end up with our b. So let's just use the first point. Uh, one equals one third zero plus b implies that one equals b. And so now I end up with my final result, y equals one third x plus one. Okay, that wasn't so bad. And of course, you've done this before, but it's probably been a while. Now, we're gonna have a fun application of this. This is what I was saying uh, yesterday. Um, this is not a physics application, which you get in most traditional calculus textbooks. This is an economics application. And I think you'll find this interesting. Um, we have a company, we're told that their costs of production are, first of all, we have fixed costs. Those are the costs that you have to pay no matter how many units you produce. For example, the rent on your building. The variable costs represent the actual materials that are used for each unit of the product that you sell. Um, let's say you're producing basketballs and um, it requires $10 worth of, I guess basketballs are made of some kind of synthetic rubber. Um, $10 worth of that goes into the basketballs. 
And so the variable costs are the ones that go up as you produce more units of the output. So what we're gonna to try to do here is um, create an equation that represents our cost of reductions. And you can see if we let X be the number of units that we produce, This is our total cost. It costs us $100 per unit that we produce plus another $1,000 for let's say the rent. Okay, well that's fine. Now this is clearly a linear function. It has a slope of 1,000 and an intercept, uh, sorry, a slope of 100 and an intercept of 1,000. Looks something like this. So what do we want to know? Well, here's a simple question. If we produce 20 units of our product, how much does it cost to produce 20 units? So basically what that means is you're replacing your X with 20. And in this very simple case, our cost of production is $3,000. Now, later on, we're going to see how to decide what would be the optimal number of units to produce. But that's going to take a while. Okay, not just yet. For now, it's enough to note that based on this information, producing 20 units of our product will cost us $3,000. All right, then. Now, we, we often want to consider uh, when we introduce new functions, how to graph them. And so um, let's just start with this one. Now, already we can see that the slope is negative two thirds. Intercept is five. So, I mean, we can get a rough idea just by doing something like this. We have an intercept and our slope. But what if I wanted to do this really properly on a piece of graph paper and figure out, take two points and draw a straight line through it, let's say with a ruler. Well, one thing I could do is this. Um, suppose I arbitrarily decide that I wanna show the points where X equals zero and three. Okay, so I only need two, by the way. Two will uniquely determine the entire graph. This one is easy. I mean, it's pretty clear that when X is zero, the function itself equals the intercept. So in other words, F of zero is just five. So that's the easy one. What about this one? We're asking for X equals three. Now that may or may not be the horizontal intercept. So for F, X equals three, let's do this. So that tells me that the point three comma three, let's say that's about here, is on this line. By the way, how would you find the horizontal intercept? In other words, where the line crosses the horizontal axis. What you would have to do is this, um, set the entire function equal to zero. Okay, so in other words, you would have two thirds X equals five. Okay. So this point right here would be 15 halves comma zero. That would be your uh, horizontal intercept. So it didn't ask for that. It only asked for two points, but that should be enough to do a proper job of drawing this graph uh, on a piece of graph paper. So in fact, I did it right here in Excel, and there you go. So again, it's kind of awkward looking, but it does work. So you know what we could do? We could bring this into Symbol Lab, and it'll it'll give us uh, this information anyway. Um, let's go back here and look at it.
Okay, minus two thirds X plus five. We'll ask it for a graph. And there you go. So right here, it'll tell us, yes, 15 halves two, uh, sorry, 15 halves and zero is the intercept on the horizontal axis. The vertical intercept is of course, zero comma five. It probably did all the rest too. Um, here's the slope. It shows you how to do the slope. Um, and it shows you a little bit of everything. All right. And so we've already seen how to do the x-intercept or horizontal intercept just by setting the entire function equal to zero and solving for x. All right, um, and just a quick reminder, um, a flat line has a slope of zero. A vertical line has an undefined slope. Why is that? So with the horizontal line, No matter what two points I pick, y will never change. So the slope is zero. But for a vertical line, no matter what two points I pick, The, it's the x that's not changing. And so you're, you've got division by zero, and so this is undefined. Okay, so that's, that's why that's happening. Okay, so I see that it's quarter after I've gone a little over. So let's stop for a few minutes and have our break. And when we get back, we'll carry on. So you can see this section is kind of straightforward because it involves linear functions that we're very familiar with. But then at some point, we're gonna switch over to um, logarithmic and exponential functions, which are a little trickier, but I'm sure you've run into them before. So uh, let's stop right about here. And uh, I'll see you all in a few minutes.
<sighs> All right, so we're back. By the way, I just want to show you something. Um, the video from last night is in my YouTube account where it belongs. Let me just show you where it is. <clears throat> All right, so you go to my account, and the way it's set up is um, from A, you can go to your channel, and here it is, playlists. So we are, of course, 1500 when you click this on. Well, you can watch the video from there, or if you just want to look at the list of videos, um, that should be right here. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so... Um, if you want to watch one of the videos, you can do it directly from there. And so, um, I, again, something I have to remember to do every night. Um, but last night, I remembered to get it up there. It, it does take a while. It's a very large video. But um, once it's ready, then I can just post it there and you can watch it anytime you want to. So this is where they'll all be hidden. Now, I don't know that much about YouTube. I, you can see this. there's a lot of stuff here. Um, I don't know how much of it you can really look at besides our playlists. So, but I don't think there's anything on here that I would have any problem with you looking at. So um, if you see stuff that excites you, you know, you can go ahead and take a look at it. Um, mostly it's notes from other classes that I've done online. I've got a bunch of music videos in here too, but I don't know if you can see them or not. Um, <laughs> I just don't know. I mean, uh, that's my technology knowledge is pretty thin. So, um, but that's okay. If you want to look at my music videos, that's okay. I don't care. All right. Well, anyway, let's get back to this. So oh, that's, sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, let me get this one put away. I'll save it one more time. All right, here we go. So um, now, okay, now here's something you um, just briefly need to discuss. Um, how do you tell if two lines are perpendicular or parallel? Okay, well, two lines are parallel if they have the same slope. Now they must have a different intercept, otherwise they're just the same line. But if the slope is the same, then you're gonna have two parallel lines. Interestingly enough, the two lines will be perpendicular if the product of their slopes is negative one. So, um, we'll look at an example in a second here. Um, if you multiply the slopes, it doesn't matter what their intercepts are. If you multiply the slopes and the product is negative one, that means that we're looking at um, perpendicular lines. And of course, perpendicular means that they are at right angles to each other. Let me see if I can draw that properly. So let's just say that um, here's a line, and here's another line. If they were perpendicular, where they cross, you see it's a right angle where they cross right here. OK, so the only way that can happen is if they have um, they're, like I said, the product of their slopes is negative one. So here's some examples. Oh, one more thing. I might as well label this properly. Okay, so like these two, it should be pretty clear that these lines are parallel because they have the same slope with, of course, a different intercept. So I've drawn these in Excel, and you can see that they're identical except for the location where they cross the vertical axis, which means that they must be parallel. And you can see it's pretty obvious here that they are parallel. The spread, the gap between them never changes. What the reason why this is relevant is because that means that the two lines will never cross each other. So let me just throw this in here. Um, Let 
normally straight lines cross each other at exactly one point. This is the exception. Otherwise, they're guaranteed to cross at exactly one point. Here, they never will cross. So um, if we, now you might remember this from uh, another math class, are trying to solve a system of simultaneous equations, there will be no solution if the equations represent parallel lines. So let's just quickly review that for a second, that concept of simultaneous equations. Let's say that, for example, you were told, uh, now I'm gonna to try to make up a good example here that works out properly. Let's say you're told that we have this following situation, three X plus four Y equals eight and two X minus three Y is nine. So these basically represent two lines. Now, I don't know what they look like, but what we do know is that they will cross each other. They don't have to be perpendicular. In fact, let me not draw it like that, but we're guaranteed that they will cross as long as they're not parallel. Let's say it looks like that. Okay, now how do you know where that happens? So you might recall this technique you can use. What you can do is now it can get a little tricky. What I'm gonna do here is multiply the second row. Well, actually I'll multiply the first row by two. And of course I have to multiply both sides and then I'll multiply the second row by negative three. Why am I doing this? I wanna make sure that one of the variables drops out. So in other words, I'm gonna end up with six X plus eight Y equals 16 and minus six X plus nine uh, Y equals minus 27. If I combine these, I end up with 17 Y is minus 11, which means that Y is minus 11 over 17. And that implies, let's say I go back to the first equation. Now, I obviously picked a very clumsy example here, but, um, Oh, let's see, I'm running out of space, of course. Let's just spill this over into the next slide. So what I'm trying to solve for is 3x minus 44 seventeenths equals eight. So what I'm gonna do is rewrite this in terms of seventeenths. Um, that would give me one, 36, and then I add them. And X therefore equals, if I divide both sides by three, this is the same thing as 180 uh, times 3 seventeenths. Oh my God, what a mess. Okay, but the idea here is that we figured out that Y equals negative 11 seventeenths and X equals 540 over 17. That's the point where they cross. And so that is the solution of these two simultaneous equations. This is the only point they have in common. Now, if these had been parallel lines, I would have ended up with no solution at all. Instead, because they're not, I'll end up with a unique solution, which is exactly what I'm looking for. Anyway, now, as far as the perpendicular lines are concerned, um, you can see here that the slopes are two and negative one and a half, and that product equals negative one. That tells me that the two lines are perpendicular. Now, when I drew this in Excel, it didn't work out too well. It's hard to tell by looking at this that they're really perpendicular. So I'm gonna try this in symbol lab just to see what it looks like. But the idea here is that when you multiply the two slopes, the product is negative one, and that guarantees that the two lines are perpendicular, which also means they do have, uh, if you try to solve these uh, simultaneous equations, there will be a solution. 
All right, let's go back to Symbol Lab and see what these look like. So um, we start with um, y equals 2x plus 4. All right, and then we ask for the interactive graph. Apparently that's what lets you add more than one. And then the other one was negative a half of X plus eight. See, now it's, it's pretty clear. You can see right there that they are in fact par uh, perpendicular. Those are definitely right angles where they meet. The Excel graph is kind of weak. Um, in fact, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna make a little bit of editing here on the notes. And there we go. Okay, so you can really see much better how they are indeed perpendicular to each other. All right. Um, so yeah, um, so here's another example of what I was talking about before. How do you find that point where they cross? So here they are. Now, this is a, a slightly nicer example. Um, and so basically what you're trying to do is set these equal to each other. Um, you can use simultaneous equations for this, but because these are so simple, Another option you have here is to simply set them equal to each other because you can see this is written as y equals. So if we set these equal to each other, um, you can see how easy it is to solve for x. And then once we have x, we can plug it into either of the original equations and come up with a value for y. It's a little messy, but it turns out that y is 6 fifths. So we have the coordinates of the point where the two lines cross is 17 fifths comma six fifths and um and we could graph this if we need to but let, we don't have to bother um we know that these lines wherever they cross they cross at the point x equals 17 fifths y equals six fifths and you can prove this by plugging in 17 fifths into each equation and you'll see that um in both cases y will have the same value in fact, why don't we try it? If X is 17 over five, here Y would be All right, so we proved that this one will have a Y of six fifths. What about the second equation? Why, what do you know? It's the same. Either way, when you plug in x equals 17 fifths into either one of these equations, you're going to get a y value of 6 fifths, which proves that this is the intersection between them. All right, now, oh, here we go, another application. Now, here we have a sporting goods company that sells football helmets. In order to produce the helmets, each company has a fixed cost of 250,000, um, or the company has a fixed cost of $250,000 a year. Each helmet has a variable cost of $120.
Okay, so we know that the cost equation is y equals um, 120x plus 250,000. Now this time though, we have something new. We can sell these helmets for $140,000. Uh, what am I saying? $140. Now, here's the question. What would be the break-even point for this company? In other words, what is the number of helmets that we can produce at which our profits are exactly zero? So if you can visualize this as a set of graphs, uh, two lines. The first line would be the y equals 120x plus 250,000. And then the other function is simply y is 140, which is a straight line. And so the break-even point is right here. The question is, what is the value of X? How many helmets do we have to produce in order to have a profit of zero? Okay, so because at this point, the revenues are equal to the costs. Okay, the revenues are $140 per helmet. The costs are $120 per helmet plus 250,000. So what we're gonna do is, uh, oh, I just, I just realized I messed it up. Um, it's not 140, it's 140X. Sorry about that. It's, um, that's what I get. sorry about that. It, it's going to look something like this. Okay, so this top line is the revenues. This bottom line is the costs. And in this section up here, we have profits. In this section down here, we have losses. Okay, you can tell because in the red zone, revenues are greater than profits, uh, the costs rather, Profits are positive. In this green zone, the profits are negative. It's only here the profits are exactly zero. And we call this the break even point. What is that point? Now, by the way, you can tell by the way this function is, these functions are written. Once we get past that point, no matter how many helmets we produce, as long as they're more than that number, we're gonna make a profit. Okay, so we need to know what would be the point at which we're breaking even, and then we may decide to produce more than that. But, um, so what we're gonna actually do is set them equal to each other. The only way to find out where the lines cross is to set the two equations equal to each other, and we solve for X. So, we find that when we do this, the break-even point is 12,500. All I did was algebraically, I set them equal to each other and solve for X. So um, that, that question mark is actually 12,500 helmets. Now, what we'd also like to know is at that point, what are the profits and the revenues? Uh, sorry, the uh, the profits are zero. What are the costs and the revenues? So we can do that very easily by plugging in 12,500 into the two functions. Okay, so there's the costs. You can see I've replaced the X with 12,500 will be $1.75 million. The revenues will be the same. If you multiply 12,500 by 140, you'll get the same number.
And so that means we're, costs and revenues are identical to each other. We call this the break even point. If we continue to produce more helmets, the costs will rise, but not as quickly as the, uh, sorry, the, the revenues will rise more quickly than the costs. And so as a result, we'll end up making profits. In fact, you could prove it by trying, uh, I don't know, let's say, um, let's, let's repeat the uh, functions here. The revenues are y equals 140x, and the costs, if you recall, are 120x. plus 250,000. Break even point is where X equals 12,500. So let's just randomly choose, let's say 13,000. As we start from that diagram, this should produce profits because revenues will be 140 uh, times 13,000 all right I have to get out my calculator for this one okay 140 times 13,000. is uh, 1,820,000. All costs. Y is 120X plus 250,000. All right, so that's equal to one million eight hundred ten thousand. So the profit is, of course, revenues minus costs. And you can see. that's gonna be $10,000. Okay, so just as we figured from that diagram, anything past the break even point, as we keep increasing X, in fact, the profits will continue to rise. Now, in practice, it doesn't usually work this way. The costs will start to rise more quickly after a while at least. But um, in this simple example, as we produce more output past the out, um, break even point, our profits will just continue to rise. But the point of it is that we found this information by solving simultaneous equations. Okay, now again, it's hard to tell with this Excel graph, but that would be right about here. Oh, geez, this thing is terrible. Um, so anyway, that's how we found it. All right, so now we're gonna switch over to something a little bit more involved. Um, we're gonna introduce, reintroduce to you something called a polynomial and a polynomial is written in the following form, and you can see the exponents can be anything, although as it turns out, um, the word polynomial implies that the exponents are integers, specifically non-negative integers. In other words, you're not going to see any zeros in there, one, two, three, four, that kind of thing. You're not gonna see 7.2, for example. So uh, as complicated as this looks, uh, just keep in mind, the linear function is a special case of this, where we only have these terms. And then a quadratic function is just these terms. And then as you get, you get the idea, cubic means you're adding ax cubed, and then, you know, the rest, you add higher exponents. But all of these in general are referred to as polynomials, where it just means many numbers, basically. 
Now, here we're going to introduce um, some terminology here. The word degree is going to be used to represent the highest exponent in our polynomial. So in other words, um, a polynomial with degree one is a linear function, okay? Because the highest exponent is one. A quadratic function is a polynomial with degree two because there's no terms higher than x squared. And then finally, a cubic function is a polynomial function with degree three. I don't, I'm sure there are names for the higher order ones, but I don't know what they are offhand. So most of the functions that we've seen, that you've run across, are typically polynomials. Although later on, we'll see some other types that are not polynomials. But a lot of the times, especially in applied areas, the functions that you deal with are uh, polynomials. So now here, we're going to have to ask ourselves if, to identify any functions in here that may not be polynomials and try to figure out why not. So it turns out, the first one is okay. The issue here is whether or not the exponents are indeed integers. This one is fine. Um, there's an implied one here. This one is no good because of this negative two. Okay, that's what the problem is. The exponents must be non-negative integers. And so that tells me, for example, something like this. is also not a polynomial. Because the exponent is not an integer. All right, so the degree, as we've already seen, the degree simply refers to the highest exponent in the uh, equation. So it's easy to identify. For example, this first one is ordered four. And by the way, you notice we almost always we try very hard to make sure that when we write out the terms of a polynomial, the highest exponent comes first and then all the rest follow. So that makes it easier to see what the degree is. So here, for example, we have four, here we have seven, and then finally here we have five. That's all there is to it. All right, now sometimes it's important to know the so-called leading coefficient. And just as a quick reminder, when you have an expression like this, let's say you have five X to the third power, this number in front of the X is, is known as a coefficient. Okay. This of course is the exponent. And the X itself is known as the base. Okay, so when you have an expression like this, the number that's multiplied by the variable is the coefficient. Um, the variable in this case is the base. And then the exponent is the power that it's raised to. Uh, just keep in mind too, that when you have just plain old X, there's an implied coefficient of one. And there's also an exponent. There's an implied exponent of one. In other words, x is considered to be the same thing as one times x to the first power. Okay, they don't have to be written, but they're assumed. All right, so let's look at a few other quick examples. Um, this one has a leading coefficient of five because that's the highest exponent. That term is the leading term and they said the coefficient is five. And then for this one, it would be simply nine. That's all there is to it. And then finally, this last one, leading coefficient is eight. Okay, so let me go back to this one real fast. So this one was five. You can see now why it's so important to write these in the correct sequence, um, because otherwise you'd be scanning through all the terms to find what you're looking for. All right, now we're gonna move ahead to another special case, quadratic functions, okay? So we spend a lot of time with linear functions, which are of course polynomials of degree one. Now we're gonna move up to degree two. 
the quadratic function, which you've studied before. And in general, it's written as f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And um, we're just going to assume that a and b are not zero. Uh, because, well, actually, no, I shouldn't say that. It, a, if, as long as a is not zero, b can be zero. In other words, if you had something like this, then b is zero and it's still a quadratic function. It's a, a has to be non-zero. Otherwise we end up with a linear function or possibly a constant. Now, when you draw a picture of a quadratic function, we're gonna end up with something called a parabola. Now we mentioned this last night, a parabola is symmetrical and it is shaped like a big U, except that the U can either be facing up or facing down. Those are really the only two possibilities. There's also symmetry. Now symmetry means that there's some dividing line, which is called a vertex, by the way. And the right and the left are the same. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. The vertex is this point. The line is called the axis of symmetry. We'll get back into this later on, but the point at which the function is reaching a minimum is the vertex. In fact, let me move this up here. And then that line through it is called the axis of symmetry. Same thing down here, there's a maximum point, which we'll call the vertex. This is the axis of symmetry. And then that simply means that what's going on, on the, to the right of that axis and the left are identical to each other. Now, whether or not the parabola faces up or down depends on the uh, coefficient of x squared. Okay, so the function, yeah, so if A is positive, the parabola opens upward. If A is negative, the parabola opens downward. If A is equal to zero, then it's not a parabola at all. It's a straight line. So we can rule out that case. Okay, we don't have to worry about that. It's either positive or negative. If it's zero, it's no longer a parabola at all. It is simply a straight line or possibly a constant depending on the sign of B. So here's a few that I chose at random. Um, so here you can see that A is positive. So the uh, curve shifts uh, faces up. Uh, I, hold on, I have to do one thing here. Just saving it. So this way, you know, this is the version that has the handwriting in it. All right, now how about this next one? Oh yeah, so you can see this one faces down because the leading coefficient is negative. And then finally, of course, if A is zero, then we end up with a straight line. All right, so here's, here's the characteristic of the parabola. I just started to mention this earlier. Um, we have the vertex, which is either the minimum or maximum point. The axis of symmetry goes through that point. It splits the parabola in half. There are solutions, which means where does it cross the horizontal axis, these two points? And then of course, somewhere along the way, it also crosses the uh, vertical axis.
Now, one interesting thing about parabolas, and I think I mentioned this last night, is that there is an exception uh, here. If the entire parabola uh, is direct is above the horizontal axis, let's say you have something like this. You do have a y-intercept, uh, you do have a vertex, you do have an axis of symmetry, but here's the thing. There are no real solutions because it doesn't cross the axis. So what happens instead is the solutions are imaginary numbers. So if you plug, if you took this equation and plugged it into the quadratic formula, remember, um, let me just remind you what it looks like. And we'll review this in a little bit. What will happen is in this case, b squared will be less than 4ac so that the square root is negative. Okay, so that's what, what's happening here. Um, B squared is less than 4AC. The area, uh, the value under the square root is negative, which implies that we have imaginary numbers. This can only happen if the entire parabola is completely above the horizontal axis. So we'll assume in this class that, that we'll never run into this case. We'll always have real solutions. Okay. Um, you, you might run into something different in a, in a different class, but here we're going to assume that each one of these has only real solutions. By the way, there is also another bizarre case. If this exactly touches the horizontal axis, there's only a single solution and it is zero. Okay, so uh, other than that, though, you'll have two real solutions. Anyway, so the vertex is in fact. The, like I said, because the parabola only can face up or down, you're either going to have this situation And you can have this situation. And that's, of course, the maximum of Y. The question is, how do you find that point? Okay, now the intercept is, is easy because you just set y equal to zero or f of x is equal to zero. The vertex is a little trickier. It requires us to use a slightly different format for expressing the quadratic equation. So remember, just like before with the linear equations, we have at least three different ways of expressing it. The same thing is true here. A quadratic uh, equation can be expressed in at least two different ways. One of them is designed to explicitly show us the value of that vertex. So in other words, this is what you're going to get. Instead of the traditional form, we can write it like this with the understanding that the h and the k here are the coordinates of the vertex. So this is a bit of a mess, but it has its advantages. In other words, if you have it written this way, you can see at a glance what the vertex is. Um, that would be the main benefit of writing your equation this way. So we're gonna do some examples of this, but I see that it's 10 after. So I guess we better not do it now. Um, you'll need time to recover from this. So we'll stop right here. And what we'll do is we'll pick it up here on Thursday, not, not Wednesday. Remember, we only meet um, on uh, we only meet on um, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Okay. So, um, so if there's no last minute questions. I guess we'll stop here and we'll pick it up again on Thursday. Thank you.
All right. See you next time. Thanks, Professor. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye.